Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Breachside Broadcast, home of the finest fox casting either side of the breach. On today's episode, we continue the story of Cornelius Bass and his daughter Bernadette as they seek to bring the cult of December to justice. I hope you enjoy the conclusion of a warm welcome, right after this word from our sponsor. This episode of the Breachside Broadcast is brought to you by the Redemption Butcher Shop. If you're tasting meats, verges into the unusual, you can be sure we have just what you're after. We pride ourselves on stocking the choicest cuts and the juiciest morsels this side of Malifaux City. Drop in and place your order today. No questions asked. The next morning, the frost around their campsite had melted. The drip-drop of water hitting snowdrifts reached them from the town. Steam rose from the roofs and the ground. Everything smelled of wet soil. Crockett crouched next to the battered, frozen torso the ice garment had left. He followed some invisible trail back to a hastily erected barn. Only sinew and bones inhabited the space now. Holy... Bernadette said with a grimace. Reichardt pressed his lips together into a thin line. Cornelius covered his mouth with a gloved hand. Crockett pointed at marks on the exposed reddened bone. Someone's been gnawing on this. Through gritted teeth, Cornelius asked, Can you find who did this? Crockett nodded. Let's go, Cornelius replied. Reichardt gave a sharp incline of his head. I want to take them in alive. Cornelius looked at each person in his posse. Crockett snorted. Want to end up like that torso, lore man? If it was our lives or theirs, I won't hesitate, Bass, Reichardt said. Bernadette stood with her arms crossed, staring out into the wilds. Bernadette, Cornelius prompted. If they hurt kids, she growled, I can't promise anything. I'll make the final decision. Remember, we're looking for justice, not revenge. Cornelius made sure everyone understood. So you say, Bernadette muttered. Let's go. She shrugged off her blankets. While there's still some good left we can do. They crept through the wilderness. In his eerily quiet way, Crockett searched for any signs of the cult of December that remained in the summer heat. Parting thick, leafy branches, the guide uncovered a mangled skeleton hidden there. The human skull stared past them into nothingness, grimacing for the rest of eternity. The bones were scored with knife and teeth marks. Cornelius frowned. This was the world he'd brought his child to to keep her safe. Getting close, Crockett drawled with far too much cheer. We need to move faster. Bernadette stomped past Crockett and away from the remains. Wait. Cornelius grabbed at Bernadette's shoulder. She turned and glared. I'm not going to let some kid die because I was too late. Are you, Dad? I don't want my kid to die, he barked. You're reckless. You've always been reckless. But this time in this place is going to get you killed. She snorted. You're being an overbearing, overprotective mama bear. You can help or you can go home. I can't go home because of your actions, or don't you remember? Cornelius growled. I was in the right, Bernadette shouted. They would have murdered that boy if I hadn't stepped in. 
I know, Cornelius hollered right back. You want us to find the cannibals? We want them to find us, Crockett interrupted. Shut up, Crockett, Bernadette and Cornelius shouted. The guide shrugged and vanished into the brush. Cornelius dragged his hand down his face in exasperation. That's why we fled. That judge whose son you killed was going to see you hang no matter what. I was defending myself, Bernadette spat. Besides, he was corrupt and no better than his no-good son. It doesn't mean he doesn't have power, B, Cornelius groaned. She rolled her eyes. You have to wise up. You can't keep fighting injustice this way, or you won't be long fighting. Cornelius didn't beg. It was a simple statement of truth. A nearby explosion startled them out of their argument. Clods of dirt rained down on them as a harpoon appeared in their midst, sprouting out of the earth and just missing Reichardt. This is why you don't argue when hunting cannibals, Reichardt muttered as he turned to face their new assailant. A group of women wearing heavy coats and scarves over their mouths emerged from behind the rocks and trees. They carried harpoon guns and long hunting knives. Frost crept over the ground where they stepped. These the cannibals? Bernadette asked, her breath visible on the cold air. The links of her chain clanked against each other as she pulled it out. Yes, Reichardt settled into a fighting stance. Cornelius gritted his teeth. You're wanted for kidnapping and murder. I suggest you come quietly. One of the cultists began to pace behind the others. She stared at them with an unsettling intensity. I don't like the look of that, Bernadette said under her breath. We will defend ourselves, Cornelius warned. Another cultist drew her finger across her throat in threat. Last chance, he announced. Come peacefully. I don't think they're listening, Dad. Bernadette narrowed her eyes at the hostiles surrounding them. Cornelius knew that Crockett was out there, ready to pounce. He held up his hand and called out, Don't kill them. I intend to take them in. That's his no-nonsense voice, Bernadette said. Better heed. Harpoons whistled through the air. They clanged against Reichardt's claw as he knocked them out of the way. It'll make this fight much more difficult, Bass, since they are trying to kill us. Don't care. Do as I say, Cornelius ordered. Take them out. Do not kill. He turned on his heel and smashed his fist into the face of a cultist creeping up behind him. Her hunting rifle clattered to the ground as she fell. Bernadette's chain whistled through the air and slammed into a body with a clank and a thud. The cultist cried out in pain. In a surge of unexpected speed, Reichardt raced toward the cultist who stayed back and aimed their harpoon guns at the posse. Crockett emerged, swinging his axes back and forth as silent as their enemies. As cultists attacked him, his savage barrage held them at bay. A knife bit into his arm, blood spattering to the ground. For just a moment, Crockett looked at the spray of red. Then he roared. Crockett, no! Cornelius shouted. Snarling and snapping, the guide charged at the cultists. The cannibals fell under the vicious onslaught, barely able to defend. He swung and swung, his axe blades glinting red. Crockett, Cornelius tried again. The former sheriff grunted as he deflected a hunting knife with his own and crushed his attacker's nose with the handle of it. The cultist went down, groaning and clawing at her face. Another cultist swung at Cornelius. The former sheriff grimaced as he knocked the knife to the ground, clenched his hand and slammed his fist into the cultist's jaw. He felt teeth snap together and something crack. Something whistled just past his head. Another knife, another cultist. But this one was staying in range, slashing at him from arm's length away. Leaping up, he kicked at the new attacker, using his powerful legs and the metal guards he wore over his boots and shins to break the cultist's knife arm. Bone protruded and the cultist shrieked. As he looked around, each of his posse had taken out the rest of the cannibal group. Bernadette stood next to Crockett, her chain wrapped around him, he struggled against the lynx and snapped at the cultists with his teeth when he couldn't free himself. Hey, she barked. The hell is wrong with you? You see in red, Reichardt observed as he stepped up next to Cornelius. Berserk. Calm yourself, Crockett, Cornelius growled, holding him back. Crockett lunged at the elder bass. How about this? 
Bernadette punched the guide in the face. The guide turned on her. She shrugged and hit him twice more. Crockett collapsed. The other three stood around him. Well, that was effective, Reichardt stated. Sometimes it takes a woman's touch, you know, Bernadette said with a smirk, her chain jangling merrily. Where am I? Crockett slurred. He flailed his limbs and sat up with an unsteady sway. Cornelius crouched next to the disoriented guide who blinked up at him. Are you going to fight us? Crockett squinted at him. Are you going to fight me? He's fine. Cornelius began to hand the wild man his axes, then hesitated for a moment. His voice was gruff, commanding. As he said, Don't turn on us again, Crockett. Crockett just stared back with tired eyes. Cornelius raised one eyebrow, but handed Crockett his weapons anyway. They needed his help if they were going to take on more cultists. Crockett rubbed at his cheek where bruises with the distinct pattern of the seams on Bernadette's gloves turned his skin a nasty purple. Who hit me? Does it really matter? Bernadette asked. Anyway, we bandaged up and handcuffed the cultists we beat. They aren't saying anything at all. It's creepy. You need to find the main camp, Cornelius told the guide. I thought you wanted to arrest them or something. Crockett hitched a thumb toward the glaring trust cultists. The former sheriff grunted. That would be ideal, but the people of redemption take priority in this case. Crockett shrugged and pushed himself to standing. You all right with those cannibals dying out here if we can't get back to them? You seem the moral type is all. Cornelius frowned. I'm not all right with it, but like I said, I'm putting those innocents ahead of them. They'll make you an executioner in addition to judge and jury, Reichardt intoned. So be it. Cornelius clenched his hand. They made their decisions. Bernadette watched her father. That's not you, at least not back home. That was the line you always drew, Dad. Well, we'd better get back here in time, then, he replied. Reichardt studied him. Cornelius ignored him. Bernadette nodded in agreement. Lines are hazy anyway. Crockett stood up and stumbled a little before writing himself. Watch yourself, Bass. Malifaux changes people, and not for the better. Reichardt sighed and twisted his claw. The sun glinted off the metal. Cornelius remained silent. So where are the rest of them? Bernadette asked. Crockett peered around, looking for signs. He sniffed the air. Then he pointed at a nearby mountain top with snow. Sure glad I brought Ralphie. The trees became thicker, the foliage denser. It reminded Cornelius of what people said about the West Coast, beyond the American borders, and even what the Guild owned. Tall trees with unimaginably huge trunks. He shivered despite his coat and boots. Crockett crept up about in front, weaving back and forth, eyes flicking from the ground to the horizon. He even stopped to taste the dirt every so often. Suddenly he held up a hand and dropped to the ground, prone. Cornelius, Reichardt, and Bernadette all stopped where they were and crouched. Look, Crockett mouthed, pointing at a thin wire strung between two trees. He searched the branches above. Cornelius squinted. I don't see anything, Bernadette whispered. Shh. Crockett pointed his finger toward the tops of the trees. There. Cornelius saw a well-hidden set of wooden spikes, ready to impale anyone unlucky enough or unskilled enough to trip that wire. Follow me exactly, Crockett breathed. The group wandered past several more traps, boulders that would crush them in a landslide, harpoon guns rigged to fire, and pits filled with sharpened stakes all waited for them. Crockett avoided them all with a careful grace. It was no wonder Barker had appointed him as their guide. 
They hadn't seen any traps for about a hundred feet when Crockett stopped next to some thick brush. The guide exhaled, his breath turning into ice crystals in the air. The others tensed. Then he looked to his side, right into the vegetation. The others followed his glance. Wide eyes looked back at them. Holy, Bernadette began. The person they saw through the leaves put her finger to her lips and shook her head, a terrified, desperate motion. That was when Cornelius noticed the bars. She was in a cage. Dirt and blood streaked her face. She smelled as though she hadn't bathed in days, maybe weeks, and she was young, maybe fifteen. Help us, she mouthed. Her fingers, nose, and ears were red from the cold. Through gritted teeth, Cornelius asked, his voice low. How many of you? How many of them? The girl shuffled her way over and sat with her back to them to avert suspicion. Fifteen of them. I don't know how many of us are left. Those were bad odds. Cornelius looked around at his posse. Bernadette had a flinty, determined look in her eye that Cornelius recognized as his own. A muscle in Reichardt's jaw tightened. He didn't like this any more than Cornelius did. Crockett tested the sharpness of his axe and nodded. They silently agreed. The four slipped around to the front of the cage, pausing in the shadows as the pair of acolytes passed. The girl held her breath the entire time. Open it. Cornelius quietly commanded. Crockett eyed the cage for traps, then eased the door open. The ropes and wood squeaked as he pulled on it. Cornelius stopped the girl as she slipped through the door. Where are the others? She pointed. Run, the former sheriff told her. She chewed on her lower lip. But I want to help. I could... You already have. Cornelius rested a hand on her thin shoulder. Go. She hesitated, then eventually nodded. Thank you. The four crept along, their weapons at the ready. They passed empty cages that reeked of blood and offal. Meat hooks hung from the trees. Butchered bodies dangled, swaying in the breeze even as the leaves above whispered as though nothing was amiss. Cornelius knew he'd dream about the unending dripping sound of blood for years to come, perhaps forever. Crockett raised his hand. They all froze. He gestured ahead of them. Almost invisible in the forest stood a small, temporary pavilion made of wood and branches. It had no walls, just wooden supports and a roof. On the far side, a distinctly human-looking body on a spit roasted over a fire. Men and women gathered under the structure. They'd removed their face scarves, and were chanting or humming something that Cornelius couldn't understand. Ice crystals appeared in the air, creating a snowy mist within the small building. Then, they tore into the cooked meat with their hands and teeth. One of the older women trembled and giggled uncontrollably as she ate. Bile rose in the back of Cornelius' throat. It burned and made him want to gag. His crew was pale. Even Crockett's lips were pressed together into a thin, disgusted line. Over there. Bernadette's quiet rasp caught Cornelius' attention. She pointed to where two acolytes were placing a body on a bloody platform. A woman, who wasn't eating, performed some kind of ceremony. Eddies of snow spun around her. The temperature plummeted. Dangerous woman, Crockett muttered. Beyond the platform, a deep snowdrift was visible. More cultists wearing only long tunics, knelt in the cold and rubbed the snow over their skin. Bernadette shivered. Carefully, the four made their way around the edge of the clearing. More cages made of wood appeared in the forest. Someone inside gasped. Bernadette waved her hand at them to be quiet. Cornelius jerked his head to the side as something flickered in the corner of his vision. Nothing but leaves and branches. He frowned. Trap! Crockett nodded at an almost imperceptible wire attached to a bundle of bells. With quick hands, he disabled it. 
A clump of people in the cage stared at them, with a mixture of hope and terror on their faces. As soon as Crockett had the door wedged open, they rushed for the opening. One man reached for Cornelius. There's another one that way. Cornelius nodded and gestured for his group to move to the next cage. As they approached, something rustled in the brush. A chill ran up Cornelius' spine. He looked around again, to again find nothing. Crockett's brow furrowed in concern. His eyes darted from side to side. He inhaled through his nose, trying to identify something that eluded him. Three people waited in this cage. They trembled. Crockett reached out to unlock the door when the cage collapsed. A monster stood there, its feet and claws covered in splintered wood and human gore. Cornelius' mouth dropped open. The creature shook its head, its antlers whipping back and forth, opening its maw wide, revealing its fangs. It roared. What is that? Bernadette readied her chain, its links clinking together. Blessed of December. Reichardt lifted his arm, preparing to attack. I've heard of them. Never seen one before. I hear she once was a woman. Doesn't look blessed to me, Bernadette said through gritted teeth. With an unbelievable speed, the monster charged. They scattered. Cornelius shook his head. Impossible he said, lifting his shotgun. A freezing blast of air slammed into them. He twisted out of the way of grasping hands. The woman who had seen humming before, she snapped her teeth at him, her mouth a dark cavern where her tongue should be. Stand down, he ordered her. You still think they're going to listen? Bernadette snapped. The woman raked at him with her long nails. He blocked her strikes with the stock of his rifle. I will fire, he warned. The sorceress grinned and began to cast a spell. Shoot her, Bernadette yelled as she faced off with three acolytes. He hesitated. Reichardt swept his claw in large arcs, keeping several acolytes at bay. By the almost vacant look in his eye, Crockett was nearing another frenzy, but he was surrounded. They were outnumbered badly. They needed a strategy. Bernadette was right. Cornelius needed to cross that line. Kill the acolytes. I'll take the priestess and the monster. He spoke from logic and reason. The words came out easily, but his stomach twisted at what it meant. He pulled the trigger, saw the woman's eyes narrow in determination, and then he was flying through the air. His shot went wild. Cornelius landed hard, but rolled to his feet, barely dodging the Blessed of December's huge claw. The creature prepared to ram him again. Bernadette grunted as she whipped with her chain and stabbed with her knife. Crockett's axes were turning red with blood, but so was his shirt where knives had nicked him. Reichardt slipped in acolyte gore. As he breathed, the metallic stink of blood filled Cornelius' nostrils. He kept his distance and fired again and again. The Blessed of December snarled. Fingers of frost reached across the open wounds of the beast channeled by the nearby priestess. Blood and muscles slowed as the snowy patches closed around the lesions, making each attempt at damaging the creature impossible. He didn't know how much longer he could hold out, how much ammunition he had, how long his crew could endure. In the blink of an eye, the monster was on him once more. Its teeth tore through his arm like jagged knives. With his other hand, Cornelius pulled out his own knife, and jammed the blade into the creature's angry dark eye. The beast let loose its toothy grip in a violent roar. Holding the ribbons of his flesh together with his good hand, he rolled to dodge another attack. Bernadette had a nasty gash over one eye, sweat and blood blinding her, but the cultists looked battered and beaten too, their blood spilling out over their cloaks and scarves. Crockett screamed something unintelligible, and kept fighting, but he stumbled as he did so. Bodies piled up at his feet. Blood sprayed as Reichardt took out acolyte after acolyte with his claw. The one without a tongue grinned. A mist exploded from her feet, obscuring the forest. Steadying his shotgun with one hand, Cornelius fired. 
the woman collapsed, rivulets of red pouring from her wound. Despite stopping her from being able to heal the monster any further, he couldn't help but focus on what it meant to shoot an enemy in the back. Help! a reedy voice called. Cornelia snapped out of it and turned to see the first girl they'd saved, a knife to her throat. An acolyte dragged her toward the fight, her eyes intensely focused. Let her go. Cornelius turned to face the new acolyte, even as hot blood ran down his arm. You let our meat go free, she hissed, holding onto the girl tightly. He was too far away. He might hit the girl. But left in the cultist's hand, she would die anyway. Cornelius growled and pointed his gun toward the ground. He couldn't take the risk. From behind the cultist, Crockett rose up. He plunged an axe into the cultist's skull with a crack, his other axe just missing the captive. The cultist collapsed, the knife still gripped in her hand. The girl screamed, squeezed by the acolyte's frozen grip and scrambled away. In the commotion, the Blessed of December roared and rushed at the escaping girl. Cornelius lifted up his gun with one arm and pulled the trigger. The shrapnel tore through the monster's thick fur and hide. Blood ran from its eye where Cornelius previously plunged his knife. The creature continued its charge as though it hadn't felt a thing, weaving through the trees faster than anything he'd ever seen before. Stop, Cornelius yelled then shot again. It acted unaffected. He couldn't even tell if he hit or missed. Before Cornelius could reload, the beast stopped in its tracks and eyed the terrified girl, a bloody drool dripping from its maw, while what looked like a grin was stretched across its lips. Scooping her up with its massive claws, the monster crushed her in its grip. Cornelius could hear her ribs and arms snapping from where he stood. The creature stared back at him for a moment, broken girl in hand, then bolted away, leaving a trail of blood and organs behind it. It ran until it could no longer be seen or heard, vanishing into the dense forest. Crockett hollered obscenities as he continued to rage. Under his onslaught, the acolytes melted into the forest behind the Blessed of December. With no other acolytes presenting themselves to his axes, the guide took heavy, slow breaths in an effort to calm down. We need to go after it, Bernadette insisted, looking back at the others in shock that they appeared frozen in place. Rykart shook his head. We need to leave, he stated. Almost didn't make it. He looked at Cornelius' mangled arm. We're in no shape to go after that thing. It's not right, Cornelius growled clutching at his bleeding arm, and staring at the trees where the Blessed of December vanished. Frustration collectively overwhelmed them in the silence that followed. They stared at one another, bleeding, fatigued, and feeling defeated. Bernadette shouted, What the hell is this place? Welcome to Malifaux, Crockett said in between deep huffs. I hate that saying. Rykart's mouth twisted in revulsion. There are many, many more monsters out there for you to hunt down, and more people to save, if you haven't bled to death. Cornelius' shoulders slumped. Nothing had prepared him for this. He'd brought his daughter here, so they could live in relative peace, whatever that was. But seeing the helplessness in her eyes and feeling the blood on his hands, he began to wonder if that was the right decision. He was an executioner now, and there were so many towns left. What would be left of them when he finished? When they limped back into redemption, they found the few surviving townsfolk milling around in a daze of mourning and shock. One of the men they'd freed ushered them into a small building, the town tavern, and handed them each a beer. Another started mending their wounds with what little equipment they had available. They drank in silence. Rykart drank directly from a bottle as his injuries were cleaned. Crockett refused to be touched. Beer foam clung to his beard. 
Cornelius watched as his arm was dressed, his mind reeling. Once she was bandaged up and had her fill of beer, Bernadette pulled out the map with a rustle. Aggressively, she slashed an X through the town of Redemption with a splash of ink. This means we failed. Too many were lost, too few survived, Cornelius lamented. No more X's. No more failures. Lots of towns to visit, Crockett drolled. With a metallic thump, Rykart tapped the nearest circle town on the map with his prosthetic hand. Cornelius looked around. Each person nodded in agreement. It was time to move on. Lives depended on it. It seemed that their job had only just begun. That's it for another episode of the Breachside Broadcast. Join us next time for more Tales of Malifaux.